welcome to the First Responders Tribute Show, live and local community heroes. I'm your host, Ashley Wagner, and over the next hour, we're gonna spend an entire hour paying tribute to the local responders who keep our city safe. Starting with the Anoka Champlin Fire Department, and now joining me is our Fire Chief, Ted Masakati. Thank you for being here. Welcome yes. to the show. Thank you for having me. So I think I would love to get started with just taking a minute to explain how that relationship between Champlin and Anoka works and how, how it functions as a department between the two cities. Absolutely. We are certainly unique compared to our, our neighboring cities. Um, we're not the only one that operates like this, but, but one of few in the metro. Uh, we're what's known as a joint powers agreement. So traditionally, up until 1985, fire calls in the city of Anoka and city of Champlin were handled by the city of Anoka. And back in 1985, Champlin decided that they were growing large enough that they needed to have their own fire department. And rather than take on the expense and everything that goes along with it, they decided to work with Anoka and form this joint powers agreement. So essentially we're almost a separate corporation, if you will, ran by a fire board that's made up of council members from Anoka and Champlin and a member at large. And then I answer to the fire board, which provides us direction and we basically tell the uh, cities what, what it would cost each year and they pay me to provide that fire protection. Awesome, and in case people are not aware, there are two stations, correct? There is, there is. We have, we have one station located in Champlin and we have one station located in Anoka, strategically based on response areas. So, but both function as one fire department, not two separate fire departments. So. Awesome, that's amazing. And recently, you've transitioned to a new model when it comes to the Anoka Champlain Fire Department and how it functions. Can you explain the new model that you've transitioned to? Yeah, it's uh, another thing that's not real unique to the Metro. This is kind of the trend that's going on. And what we're finding is we, we have people still available, but as people's lives have become busier and busier, lifestyles have changed. Um, we're, we're dual income families these days and lots going on that the availability of people coming back all the time isn't there. So in order to try and accomplish the several amount of, or several hours that we look for for training and fire calls, we try to put that into a more scheduled time. So currently we're um, operating from eight to four with our full-time staff, handling a majority of the calls that we don't need a lot of people for. And then at 5 p.m. we have four people that come in, two that are housed out of the Anoka station, two that are housed out of the Champlain station. And they respond as a crew to emergencies that again wouldn't require a larger response from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. So we started operating this way. This allows a majority of my staff to be able to go do other things in the evening and not have to worry about all of the little calls, what we kind of joke as the smells and bells, fire alarms, things that aren't actual fires. Um, they, those are handled by the duty crew and then larger calls would still be paged out and staff comes back to, to assist with those. I love that. And how does that new model really benefit both communities? You know, it, it really, number one, response time. Um, having four people in the in station, in quarters, and able to respond when that call comes in. Traditionally, our fire department, along with several others around here, were handled by what's called paid on call. So a lot of people don't realize we don't have people living in the stations like a, a Minneapolis or a St. Paul. So these people work full-time jobs, Monday through Friday, some nights, some weekends, all walks. And when they're not at their full-time job, they carry a pager. And when that pager goes off, they have to respond from whatever they're doing, wherever they're at, back to the station, get the gear on, form a group on the truck, and then respond to the scene. So by having people in quarters, we're able to put people on scene quicker, which is going to effectively reduce the amount of damage potentially by fires. We can get an initial attack going with that crew while the rest of the, the people are still responding from home to back them up. So uh, medical calls, the, the fire calls, it, having that quicker response is, is a huge benefit. Wow, that's, that's just amazing. I love it. Well, aside from putting out fires, as you might Yes, the fire department often does. What are some of the other things that your team responds to between both communities? 
Yeah, it's everybody, it's the fire department. We just respond to fires. But uh, we do water rescue, both summer and winter, uh, ice rescue and, and river rescue. Um, auto extrication, we do industrial extrication, machinery accidents, things like that. Um, search and rescue, we have the Elm Creek Park Preserve here in, in Champlin. We have the Anoka Nature Preserve. So we get called out to assist with accidents that happen out there with like the mountain bike trails, using our specialized equipment to get in and, and remove those victims. Um, and then there's a number of calls like uh, hazardous materials, high and, high and low angle um, rescue, uh, confined space. Those are calls that require a lot more specialty items and specialty equipment. So rather than any department in, in our area take all of that expense on, we operate in teams. So we've got um, an Anoka County SRT or search and rescue, uh, or search and rescue, a technical rescue team. Um, we have state teams for hazmat. We have uh, uh, different groups. Our ACFIT is our fire investigation team. So we share those resources, share the costs, and, and therefore keep costs down to, to each individual city. And I have to say, the fire department has some of the coolest equipment around. Uh, you have all the cool toys if you ever want to come to Champlain's Big Trucks and Cool Stuff event. Everyone's always looking for the different things you use. You mentioned you know, when you have to pull someone out of a car situation or when you have to go into Elm Creek. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those cool, unique, specialized pieces of equipment that you have to use in certain situations? Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty blessed with uh, a, a very good fleet of equipment and, mm -hmm. and uh, tools. Um, some of the more recent things we've been transitioning to are battery-operated tools, um, eliminating the need for generators and cords. Um, and with the same Milwaukee battery that um, mom or dad might use a drill at home with, we're able to put that into our extrication tools and use those to cut people out of cars. Um, we're using those same, same batteries on power fans when we have to ventilate smoke out of buildings rather than, again, having the cords dragging behind. Portable lights are running off of those. Um, even uh, big uh, steel saws are, are running off batteries now. Um, we always have the thermal imagers. Those are always a hit. Um, being able to see heat rather than uh, item, physical items is it's kind of fun to play with in a, in a non-fire environment for people to, to see that technology. We also have that technology on our two rescue boats, which are, are set up for both the Rum River and the Mississippi. Um, those are always fun. I mentioned our UTVs. Um, those are our two brand new UTVs that we have um, that are capable of not only fighting grass fires, but also the medical rescue aspect that that we use in emergencies as well as our regular community events such as mm -hmm. Father Hennepin or, or the Anoka mm -hmm. Halloween parades. So, Awesome. Well, this show, as you know, is dedicated to all of the first responders, and we really want to take time to pay tribute to your team. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about those that are on your team. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't begin to express how lucky the residents of Anoka and Champlain are to, uh, to have such a, a dedicated group of individuals. Um, I, I mentioned the time that it takes and, and the time that they're away from their families for the training and, and the fire calls. Um, anybody that's willing to, to, at a moment's notice, drop what they're doing, come back to help their community in an emergency, uh, words just can't say enough. Um, we have... We have for lack of a better term, all walks. Um, we kind of were joking yesterday. I've got 11 people in the fire academy right now, and one of them has a women's size six boot, and one has a men's size 15. And we have one that just graduated and is living at home still, and one that is retired and looking for something else to do. So, wow. yeah, we, we, we have all walks, and, and again, we can't we can't say enough how, how appreciative we are to have um, such a great group of individuals. Awesome. And in case anyone's thinking, that sounds fun, I want to join the team, how do they go about doing that? What are the qualifications? And are you even looking? Yeah, so qualifications are, are none. Um, we actually train people in-house. We put them through a fire academy and pay for all of that training, including seat time. Um, we accept applications year-round. Um, we're a constantly changing um, um, unit, so um, typically once a year in the fall we look to hire. We have to time it based on when the academies are happening so that we can get them right in and, and get them rolling. Um, so if people are in, interested in applying, they can come to our office or, or look on our website and turn in an application, and then when we come around to a hiring time, we would reach out to those people and see if they're still interested. Awesome. Wonderful. 
Um, well, before we pause to take a tour of a fire truck, I have to mention, as I always love to do, ours don't always look like the bright red fire trucks. Can you talk a little bit about what makes the Anoka Champlin fire truck so unique? Yeah, our trucks, uh, as, as you mentioned, are not red, um, like all of our neighbors. Ours are white, and that white comes from the history of our fire department. Um, our, the Anoka Fire Department, as I mentioned, started back in 1857. And back in those 1800s, we used horses to draw the first um, steam pumpers down the road. And that is to pay homage to the white horses that Anoka used to pull the steam pumpers down the road. So we've traditionally kept our, our trucks white. Oh, I love that. I love the history. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. I Absolutely. appreciate it. We are now going to pause and take a look at another fire truck up in Andover. The Andover Fire Department is going to take you through their fire truck. Which is which is cool, but after a couple of hours, of, you know, if you have a lot of if you have a number of nights. Today at Fire Station 1 in Andover, we had the privilege of meeting up with Andover Fire Chief Dennis Jones, who gave us an inside look to their station's operations and maintenance of their city's fire trucks. Here in Andover, we're a combination fire department. We have a career staff of five, which generally work Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Predominantly, we're a paid on call fire department, which means those folks have jobs outside of the fire department. So our paid on call members come in to respond to calls that are activated by their pagers. When the pager goes off, it's an average time of about uh, six minutes for that firefighter to get from their home into the firehouse, muster a crew, and then the drive time from the firehouse to the incident. Once we arrive, especially at a structure fire, it kind of depends how quickly can we deploy something. Generally speaking, we like to say from parking brake to uh, water on the fire, about a minute. In Andover, we're an all hazard response department. So we run EMS calls, we run fire calls, public assist calls. We have three frontline engine companies like we have here behind me. We have one frontline 100 foot platform device. We have two tenders. We have three rescue trucks, two grass rigs, and we have uh, half a dozen uh, utility vehicles slash administrative vehicles. This one here is a 1,500 gallon a minute fire pump and 1,000 gallons of water. And on an engine company like this, we have all types of hoses, extrication equipment, specialized rescue equipment like struts and airbags. And we do have first aid equipment on this as well. So this is a pretty versatile toolbox on wheels, if you will. And in the spirit of being a motorized toolbox, these fire trucks are designed to maximize the efficiency of the crew as well as the storage space within each compartment. Again, we try to be uniform amongst all of our engines. So if a firefighter is working here for duty crew, but they're generally assigned station three, they know generally in the front compartment, it's gonna look similar to this. You have these little compartments here on the side, carry extra air bottles. Safety of traffic calls, extrication equipment. Here's our, what the, you know, it used to be called the jaws of life. Mm -hmm. We've got some hand tools here, and extra uh, self-contained breathing apparatus there. And then up there is our, our ladders. When we go over here, we hit a switch. The ladder rack comes down, because that way we're saving space, right? Otherwise, you see a lot of fire trucks. Those are set this way on this side of the truck, where we would lose all this compartment space. Every single inch of the truck. Is Every single, use. as much as we can, right? Yeah. The optimization of these trucks would mean nothing without the diligent attention to detail from the firefighter crews operating the vehicles, as well as the emphasis of maintenance and care across the department. The one thing I'm gonna brag about, we had a fire last night. Look how clean this rig is. It's kind of a sense of pride for the firefighters to have clean firehouses, clean fire apparatus, you know, clean utility vehicles like you have in the background there. It's also a sense of responsibility. You know, the citizens of Andover have invested heavily in our apparatus. We're very fortunate we have an outstanding vehicle maintenance facility and uh, we have three mechanics up there that are outstanding. Sometimes they'll drive out to the firehouse to take care of the problem. 
I've even seen them at the fire scenes in the event something breaks down. So again, we're very fortunate here in Andover to have great mechanics and a great support for our, for our fleet. Welcome back. Now joining me, Champlin Police Officer Jeff Brown. Welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited because we host a program here in Champlin at the Champlin Police Department called the Citizens Academy. Correct. And it is a long-standing program, and I would love for you to start with just telling us a little bit about what it is. Okay, well, the Citizens Academy is a free eight-week course that we offer at the Champlin Police Department, and it's for citizens. They, they live here or you work in the city that qualify to actually participate in the program. It's held in our emergency operations center right at the police department. We meet on Thursdays. It starts at 7 o'clock and we end sometime between 9.30 p.m. and 10, depending on how many speakers we have and how many questions and stuff from the audience. So. Well, that is amazing. What are some of the topics, if a resident were to do this program, that are covered during that eight-week course? Right. Okay. Each session we call him has a guest speaker uh, we first start out in, in the first week with uh, the chief he comes in and gives a, a welcome to everybody and we go through a tour of the facility and then it depends on what, what topic we're doing it changes from year to year but uh, we have an investigator comes in and talks about criminal investigations and how cases are handled okay we have uh, the Hennepin County Medical Examiner comes in and talks about how they work in conjunction with police departments we have uh, Oh, uh, a tour that we take to the Hennepin County Dispatch Center. We actually rent a bus from first to, and we take all the students from the police department to uh, Shenandoah Lane in Plymouth, where the dispatch center is, and we go through a PowerPoint presentation that they offer, and then we actually tour the dispatch center. We listen to 911 calls coming in. That's a, that's a favorite. That's that takes fun. a whole day to uh, the whole session. We just don't do anything but that, that field trip, basically. Mm -hmm. um, another real popular uh, session is our FATS Lab. FATS Lab is an acronym for Firearms Training Simulator, mm -hmm. and that's done with each individual student has a time allotment on that session day, and they go through about uh, 10 minutes of shoot or no shoot scenarios. Um, it's, it really puts the citizen, that's really what the emphasis of the class is, is to teach the people what it's like to be a police officer, and one way to do it is just take a look at our, our 911 center, feel what it's like to be in a shoot no shoot situation. You're actually interacting with the screen. Am I going to shoot that person? Is that a wallet? Is that a gun? Or what are they are they presenting themselves as a threat to us? And prior to that, we have tactical uh, use of force instruction where one of our firearms instructors talks about our state statute, which governs when a police officer can actually use deadly force, which is under 609.06. .06. So we talk to them about that. So those are the parameters that we're guided by. The government tells us when we when and when we cannot shoot. So it really puts the stress on stress on them to figure it out. So mm, that's fun. Yeah. And then we have. Uh, I go through my, my particular session as I, I work the traffic unit for the city. So if you see a gray Dodge Durango uh, stopping people, that's, that's me. Um, <laughs> so on uh, my session, my particular one, I talk about traffic. So I go through whatever per, my primary uses of in, instrument that I use to, to track speed is a light arts, light distancing, and, and, and it, it's a light beam that's sent out from the tool that measures the distance of the, of the speeding vehicle and sends back that distance as well as the speed. So I go over what LIDAR is and talk to them about that and what I look for in speeding vehicles and what are my stopping cars for. I want, a lot of times I'm stopping because you're on your cell phone, which is a, is a big no-no these days, and we can stop somebody and write them a ticket just for holding their cell phone. A lot of it is speed. And now with our new flock system, we're getting a lot of people that shouldn't be on the street driving with a revoked, suspended, or canceled driver's license. Mm. Um, so we talk about things like that. And then I walk them through what it's like to arrest somebody for a DWI. So not only do I go through the statute and what constitutes a DWI, what we as law, law enforcement officers look for when we're conducting a traffic stop, some of the indicators, are they speeding, are they weaving? Did they wait at a red light and then wait another 10 seconds as after it turned green? And that's kind of a telltale sign that something's either they're on their phone or they're not enough or they're just plainly not paying attention. So we'll figure out some reason to stop them. Then what do we do after we stop them? Then we go through, I take them through each step that we do, making contact with the driver, looking for indicators like slurred speech, bloodshot, watery eyes, odor, of course. And then uh, eventually I'll have them step out of the car. I'll have one of the actual class participants 
you know, in their personal yeah, vehicle, yeah. being the uh, drunk person, and uh, walk them through the field sobriety test. You know, you have mm -hmm. various indicators that you look for um, that in our tests, like walk and turn tests, balance coordination, and of course the PBT, and then all the way up to the handcuffing. Wow, that sounds yeah. like you cover just a smorgasbord of different topics throughout the class. Yeah, there is a ton of things that we cover in, in the eight weeks. And, and I always tell the students that when they first start the class that, you know, they don't know who we are. We put our pants on the same way every day. But by the end of the class, we all know each other and they know how we, how we operate. And it's just kind of a, a way to really interact with the community and, and show them what we're all about. Of course, then we get to show off some of our equipment that we use too. You know, Champlain Police Department's always on the cutting edge of technology. So we like to share that with them as well. What are some of the cool pieces of equipment they get to see during this course or even maybe a favorite that they've shouted out throughout the course? Well, I think uh, the Medi Hennepin County Medical Examiner, when uh, they come in and talk, it's just something that you just, you, you, nobody's really exposed to, to that. They, they like mm -hmm. that. And, and same with the uh, firearms training simulator. Those are some of the real uh, popular ones that, that they really like. But uh, they like to see our tactical weaponry and things that we use of our uh, bunkers that we mm -hmm. go through doors with to protect us from people. So, yeah, any little gadgetry like that uh, is good. How do you feel like this course really benefits not only the individuals who take it, but the community from the aspect of being able to see what it's like to be a police officer every day? Right, I think what happens is people see a lot what goes on in the news and it's always sensationalized or the emphasis is put in the wrong, wrong uh, position, basically. Mm -hmm. So we like to clear things up and tell them really what it's like to be a police officer and why we do things a certain certain way. Because if you get it, you know, through the through the media, it's not always gonna be really the way it is. They're looking for clicks, they're looking for, view, for views, but this way you're able to get the proper information and the way we do it. And we're, we're guided by the, the Constitution, so we basically have the same framework, but mm -hmm. we all kind of handle things a certain way to a degree. Some cities are much busier and some are a little bit more quiet, but we all basically do the same job. And this year's class is already underway. Correct. Full class. Let's say someone's watching and they're thinking, I want to do that. How can they sign up for next year's class? Right, and, and over the years, it's, it's gotten more and more popular. I've been doing this class since 1998, and it seemed like in the beginning of that, in the, in the late 90s, it, it started to build up. It moved up from Texas and into Minnesota. As it evolved, the people became, you know, had questions about law enforcement or why do we do things the way, as time goes on, it's become more and more popular. And so these past number of years, it's, uh, it's filled up. So it's very easy to get signed up. Just call our police department, say you'll want to get signed up for the Citizens Academy, and uh, we'll get you signed up for 2025, because 2024 is like you said, it's underway and we're all filled up already. Awesome, wonderful. Well, you have been an officer for many, many years. What? is your favorite part. Tell us a little bit about the job from your perspective, the many years you've done it, the many roles you've done. Well, let's see, I first started out in law enforcement in 1995 working for this city uh, as a reserve officer. And if you're ever looking to be a Champlain Police Reserve Officer, you just give us a call and we'll get you signed up for that too. That's a, a good way to segue into a career or just be involved in your community. Uh, and then I think uh, interacting with people, it's always kind of been my forte. So I like doing the Citizens Academy. I like uh, reaching out to people and just kind of show them what they do. I've always been, when I started out in law enforcement in the 90s, <clears throat> it was in Minnetrista, so we, weren't have, we didn't have a whole lot of call loads. So I ran a lot of traffic, and that's really what I like to do. And that's basic since, since 2009. I've been the traffic unit here, and, and uh, you know, Byron, we're low with uh, personnel. I might have to, you know, a year maybe or so to pull a shift and, and stuff. But primarily since 2009, I've been the traffic, and I really like doing the traffic. And what about those that you work with? Talk a little bit about your team. Uh, the team, if I could sum it up in one word, it's young and enthusiastic, I guess. Uh, the, um, I'm obviously the grandpa of the department <laughs> now. And uh, so the, the young people that we, we have come on board, of course we have a, a strict screening process and in, in interviewing and background and, and, and so forth, uh, just to see how, how eager the young guys and gals are to learn the craft and to be in law enforcement and, and to uh, interact with the community and to protect the citizens of Champlain. Um, I see this, this team is, is very cohesive and they all get along well and that's really kind of what you want. It's just like a family, it's just like mm -hmm. any family you got at home, but we're, we spend a lot of time together, especially you're, we work in shift work, so we have a day shift, a mid shift, and a, a dog shift, which is overnight. They're your family. Mm -hmm. You see them more than your family. 
I love that. And if someone thinks, I want to join that family, I want to be a part of the Champlain Police Department, are you hiring? Yes, we are. So all you have to do, it's very easy. If you're post eligible and you have the two-year education minimum, uh, just get on the post board and uh, look for Champlain. And, and uh, you know, you can, if you're interested, come and, and go along for a, a ride along and uh, see what the city is like. And then from there, if you wanted an interview, you just get a hold of us and we'll call you in for an interview. But yes, we are, we are looking for good candidates. Awesome, awesome. Well, you mentioned earlier, one of your favorite part is just the interacting with the community. You love that aspect of the job, and that's something I think the Chamberlain Police Department does such a great job with, is you host so many community events throughout the year um, to connect with those old and young, all aspects. And I would love for you to talk about just a few of your favorite community events I think you have coming up. A Coffee with the Cop. Tell us a little bit about what's it like to have coffee with the cop. Yeah, and that's also posted on our website, too. You can have coffee with the cop at various different locations. And mm -hmm. same with the ice cream with the, with the cone with the cop. Uh, just go to our website, and you can meet the cop and have a cup of coffee, have an ice cream cone, and just get to know us and get to know you. And, and sometimes we've got some, some pretty good numbers that, that show up to, to, see, to just interact and, and talk to each other. It's so fun when you can just grab an ice cream cone with the kids yeah. or have a coffee with someone. Right. One of the other ones you've mentioned that you love doing is Father Hennepin Festival, just a, can yeah. a chance to get out there and connect with the community. What is that like? Well, that, that's again, you're connecting with the community. It's the, it's, and in the first week of June, that's a pretty big event here in, in Champlain. And actually this, this year, it's gonna be starting on Thursday instead of Friday. So we have a whole extra day, mm -hmm. the parade and the events and the concert here at the mm -hmm. Dan Shell. Uh, but just interacting with the people and they come up and talk to you. The kids come up and talk to you. And it's, it's really cool. And, you know, it's, you know, you wanna be a police presence there to, to uh, make sure everybody's uh, not acting out. <laughs> awesome, I love that. And if anyone has any questions about any of these upcoming events or a chance to connect with the police department, they can go to the website. Correct. They can follow us on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, the Champlain Police Department has a social media page. The city of Champlain has a social media page. And then the website has an interactive calendar where you can find all of these fun events right, to connect. Right. Yep. Awesome, well thank you so yep. much thank for you. being here with us today. We appreciate it so You're very much. Welcome. All right, we're gonna take a break and then we will be right back. Which is which is cool, but after a couple of hours of, you know, if you have a lot of if you have a number of nights, uh, you're busy on nights and you're wearing those for hours. It's a chilly Thursday morning, and I'm climbing aboard LifeLink's Augusta 119 KX medical helicopter Power like this and then we'll secure you in the uh, the seat belt and this is going to allow us to talk because obviously the uh, the engine's right here so mm -hmm. we're going to be able to communicate while we're up there my crew for the day is mike lewis the pilot tyler christofuli a flight paramedic and kevin rixman who is a flight nurse these men are part of lifelink's first responder team and they save lives Aboard the aircraft, I chat with the flight crew over comms. They talk a lot about the stressors of flight when you first start flying, Corey, and it's like, when you're in the back of an ambulance or in a hospital, it's pretty quiet, you know? But like here, we're all talking to each other through microphones. I mean, you got the engine right above your head right there, super loud. I learn about everything from flight procedures to the history of LifeLink, which became a nonprofit medical air transport in 1985. After a quick flight, we're back at base. Inside the hangar, I chat with Melissa Brodeur, the regional <laughs> <Yeah>. clinical manager. <laughs> we are staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week at all of our base locations. And at each one of our bases, we have always a paramedic, always a nurse, and always a pilot. 911 receives a phone call, and then the counties that we work with have an auto launch, multi-vehicle accident or cardiac arrest, that sort of thing they'll automatically launch a helicopter. LifeLink has a rich history dating back to 1979. Their mission, however, has not changed. And that mission is to provide safe and effective air medical transport. They're at the 
base, they're having their meals together, waiting for a call to come in, the tones drop, and then all three of them collectively work together to check weather and assess the risks involved and then determine location where they would be going, that sort of thing. Uh, but they all are very collaborative in accepting those transports and then getting ready for them. And during the transport as well, while they're flying either to a patient or with a patient on board, um, continuously talking about you know, air traffic that they may see, weather that they may be observing, flight patterns, distances, those sorts of things. So primarily we're taking care of the patient, but right second next to that is making sure that we're flying safely and taking care of ourselves. You know, there's a plethora of different reasons why we transport patients. Um, some of them being because it's a scene response. So a scene would be landing on a highway or landing on a baseball field or, you know, a wide open area where we can land safely and, and meet up with fire, police, EMS. You know, time is tissue. Most of the time it's trauma and re in, in orientation. The farther out state you get, we do run into some scene responses where it's cardiac, so heart attacks and strokes. You know, to the general person, LifeLink is an ambulance, but in a helicopter or in a, or in a plane. We are an air medical provider. We have helicopters uh, throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin, and then a fixed wing here located at our Anoka Airport Blaine location. When LifeLink's medical helicopter is not being deployed for an emergency, you may see them out attending family-focused community events. Thank you to LifeLink for their dedication and helping others through air transport medical services. For more information, please visit them at lifelinkiii.com. Welcome back. Now joining us, Community Resource Officer Kyle Brodkowski. Welcome and thank, thank you, you for, for having me. joining us all the way over the river from Ramsey. Yes. We are looking forward to talking about your role as a Community Resource Officer and how it differs or is similar to that of a police officer. So yeah, so with a traditional police officer, which uh, I'm still a traditional police officer, is you know, what everybody sees on TV and everything like that, we're going to calls, handling your 911s. If you need help and you call in one, your police officer is going to come. Your traffic enforcement, all of that. Me as a community resource officer, or we call our CROs, I'm still that traditional officer, so I'm still backing on calls, I'm still doing traffic enforcement, but I got the special assignment and time to kind of create things for our agency. So I help organize all our citizens academies, our safety camps, um, any community oriented type stuff. Um, I run our uh, social media, our Facebook page for the city of Ramsey Police Department and Fire Department, um, as well as, um, I'm trying to think what other events we got. Uh, our Battle of the Badges hockey game that we started last year with the city of Anoka. So in August we'll be having it again. It will be Anoka PD versus Anoka uh, Ramsey PD and we'll be doing a fundraiser hockey game. Oh, that's um, so fun. That so you get to do all the fun stuff it kinda, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, all the, all the fun stuff. Because most people when they see a law enforcement officer, it's while the interaction itself with the law enforcement officer might not be negative, it's we're called the negative scenes, right? If you're calling 911 for help, it's normally a bad day for whoever's calling 911. Us as the community resource officers get that interaction with people in a positive sense and not always in the negative type situations. Awesome. Well, you've answered a question I've had for a long time, so I appreciate it. Yeah. One other question I have that hopefully you can share a little bit about is so community service officer, police officer, um, how about a community um, service officer and how it differs from what you do. Yeah, so our agency and pretty much all agencies around here have community service officers. So community service officers is unarmed, unlicensed, and they're normally like a college student, somebody who's looking to go into a career in law enforcement. Um, they, in the city of Ramsey at least, they handle all our like animal complaints, um, city ordinance violations, uh, motorist assists, anything that's more of a low priority call 
that doesn't really require an officer to go to. That gets these individuals looking into crop law enforcement career to have the opportunity to get that experience before actually going into it. Um, Ramsey, we're actually hiring two right now. Nice. We just opened up this morning. So if you're looking to get into as a community service officer, you can go onto our city website and apply for it. Awesome. And do they also get to assist at some of the events that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So our community service officers help us out at um, our, like our Citizens Academies, they'll come be role players for us and all our city events, happy days and all that, they're out there helping direct traffic and included in all our community events. Awesome. And can you talk about some of your favorite community events? You've mentioned a few, but give us a little more detail on just the different outreach you do throughout the year. Yeah. So one of my favorite ones is the Citizens Academy that I know was mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. We ours is actually starting next week and having the community come in and getting an inside look of what we do day by day as a huge benefit. Um, every year ours is growing more and more and getting more applications and we love to see that. Our officers enjoy it and it's just a great way for people to see us as human beings more. Mm -hmm. um, the Battle of the Badges, we're going into our second annual uh, game this year. We, and we're super excited to have this happen. Um, we're still working on the date, but we'll uh, get that out there when we find out. Perfect, and if someone is like, that sounds fun, would they go to your website to just find more information? Yep, yep, we'll put it on our okay. website and on our social media once it comes out. That's awesome. What about throughout the summertime? Do you guys do any fun events? Yeah, so we'll do the coffee with the cops. We'll do, um, go out to the parks and do like uh, ice cream with a cop and have like a, or we're working on an ice cream trailer right now oh, to bring out him. to the parks and stuff like that in the summertime. Uh, as well as we go to senior centers and do like fraud presentations and all that type of stuff to educate people how to prevent themselves from becoming victims. Awesome. What about with local community schools? What type of outreach do you do for the younger generation? So our department Personally, we do not have a school resource officer, um, so that kind of falls onto us as the community resource officer to connect with the schools. Um, when they're doing events like track and field days, we'll go up to track and field and be kind of the security help with parking enforcement and hang out with the students while they're doing their different events. Um, we'll go to the schools and have lunch with the students, go to recess, um, and then we are able to work with school staff. So day to day, if the school has an emergency, when they call 911, our patrol officers handle it. We don't have a school resource officer mm -hmm. to do it. But if they have an incident and they want to follow up with us, come up with a game plan of how to handle it in the future, uh, our community resource officers will connect with the school and come up with a game plan and connections that way. How is that beneficial to make those connections with the children at a younger age? Um, just connecting with the kids at a younger age, it, they see us more than even just as people, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're fun. We like to do activities and we'll go play sports and all that type of stuff. Um, so just as they get older and having that connection and seeing us as more of a human being, it, it makes people, I mean, kind of like us more a little bit overall, mm -hmm. right? People have a little bit more respect for what law enforcement and what we do and those younger kids that may have an interest in law enforcement, we can maybe influence them to look at a career in law enforcement. That's awesome. Yeah. As we head into summertime, Ramsey does something really unique, the bike patrol. We do. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you're involved? So yeah, so our agency, any officer pretty much that wants to be on our bike patrol can be on our bike patrol. In the summertime, from June through August on Thursday nights, our city does a concert in the park. So every Thursday night, you'll see our officers out on bike patrol working those events. Um, our game fair, you'll have officers working out there. Um, as well as we are required to just on our shifts to have a couple officers once in a while out on bike patrol. So you'll see us biking through on parks in the summertime um, and at a night shift. Uh, we'll see them actually biking through neighborhoods during the nighttime. Mm. Um, sometimes they'll turn off the lights on their bikes, which they're doing that not to be dangerous, <laughs> but they were looking for people maybe breaking in the cars or bur committing burglaries, and that gives us that stealthy way to get through a neighborhood without having to drive a vehicle. Wow, that's yeah. fun. Awesome. So looking at your role in totality, what would you say is your favorite part about being a police officer? Um, my favorite part is being a police officer. Starting from when I was a, a reserve coming into uh, law enforcement, there's always just that community connection. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I put in to be a community resource officer. Just getting out and talking to people throughout the day, that's, that's what makes my job. Um, mm -hmm. Some officers, they really like to get into you know, traffic or drugs and all that different things. For me, it was always going to different businesses um, and different events and just connecting with people. 
and just having a conversation about what law enforcement is and what we do for a living. Awesome. And if someone wants to join your squad up in Ramsey, are you currently hiring? We are at the moment, we are not currently hiring. We just had our last couple officers get off of field training. Um, I believe our plan in the next couple of years is I think our chief wants to hire one officer a year for the next couple of years as our city is expanding very quickly. So I would say probably in January of 2025, we could be looking at hiring another officer. Okay, awesome. But you did mention you are looking for two. Two community resource officers, that's correct. Or community service officers, community sorry. Community service officers, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for thank you. being with us here today. We really appreciate you giving your time just to tell us a little bit more about Ramsey and the police department and all the fun community events that your city has to look forward to this summer. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate all it. All right. Well, we're going to pause right now and go talk to the K-9 unit, but we will be back. The Anoka County Sheriff's Office plays a crucial role in maintaining law and order, responding to emergencies, and providing various other services to the community. The Anoka County Sheriff's Office has a long history of canine work dating back to 1987. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. We join the Anoka County Sheriff's Office canine units on one of their monthly training days. Oh, today I think we're going to do a couple exercises, probably some of like the article searches, maybe do some bite work scenarios, some obedience, and just kind of show what we can do with them or what the dog is capable of. Currently, there are three canine units. Deputy Jesse Cutler is the handler to Diesel, who is six years old. Deputy Chris Vitek is the handler to Ozzy, who is three years old. Deputy Lindsay Swatsky is the handler to Jocko, who is 19 months old. Becoming a canine handler requires not only physical fitness and technical skills, but also a deep commitment to serving the community alongside a highly trained canine partner. The extensive training and selection process is designed to ensure that handlers are well prepared for the challenges they may face in the field. Uh, to be honest with you, it's helping the community. Um, I really enjoy helping the community and allowing the dog to speak volumes for the work that we've done. Uh, he's come a long way, as have I. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very rigorous thing to get into, and it's a lot of work. Um, the commitment for us as handlers is to have a minimum of 16 hours of training a month, and we obviously go way beyond that, but um, that's the minimum, and a lot of people don't understand that these dogs live with us every single day and we, we literally take work home with us. Um, it, it, it's really, really rewarding. All of the handlers have a passion for canines, but these canines are working dogs and are tools and resources for the Anoka County Sheriff's Office. I have always admired the resource that the dog is. The dog is a huge help, you know, depending on the situation you have, but it can save lives, it can save situations from becoming worse than they are um, or could be and the dog does a really good job at sometimes de-escalating a situation from getting worse and they just they just work really hard for you and it's very it's really awesome to watch them do that especially coming through school and working together as a team you kind of become a team in school so you come out to the road and it's really awesome to watch them blossom into an actual canine team just that it's really important to have them. Um, there's a lot that we do every single night that I think the general public probably doesn't know. Um, whether that's, like I said, looking for not only just a suspect in a crime, but maybe grandma or grandpa who wandered away from home in the snow. Uh, the dog is a great tool for that. Um, helping find someone's property that got stolen and then thrown in the grass somewhere like a wallet. We help find that stuff. Um, it's, just, it's a great tool to be utilized. I mean, every single night we're doing something with the dog. And uh, it's not always just tracking people and apprehending them. Um, it's just, it's rewarding. It's a very rewarding job. So remember, the canine units are highly trained and certified. And these canine units are only a snippet of the Anoka County Sheriff's Office. 
I'll leave you with what Sheriff Brad Weiss recently said. I often talk about what it takes to have a great law enforcement agency. We have a great law enforcement agency. There's four things, four-legged stool. Four-legged stool is great culture, competitive wages, support of the citizens they serve, and the support of the elected officials. Not every law enforcement agency enjoys that in our state. They do enjoy that here in Anoka County and specifically in Andover. Frankly, to anybody listening, you live in heaven and we intend to keep it that way. So I just want to, on behalf of these women and men that serve here, I want to thank you um, for the kind words and support that we routinely receive around here. So thank you. Welcome back. We are now here with Officer Zach Kreis. Thank you so much for being with us. And we are going to take you through an AED demonstration. But before we jump into that, let's talk about the importance of the AED and why would we want to have a device like this nearby us as often as we can. So during sudden cardiac arrest, um, the sooner you can start CPR and the sooner you can apply an AED some, to somebody, the better outcome is achieved. Awesome. And how would we know we're in a situation and it's time to call for help, call for an AED? Take us through what that scene would look like. So um, if you have somebody suddenly uh, pass out for say or, or just fall to the ground, what you're going to do is um, you're going to look and see if they're breathing. Uh, you're going to listen for if they're breathing and then you're going to check a pulse. And you're essentially going to uh, side of the neck with your two fingers, check a pulse. And, and if they're not breathing and don't have a pulse, that's when uh, that's when we call 911 and then start CPR and ultimately hopefully get to an AED. Awesome. And let's pretend that, you know, we're in a situation, the person is having cardiac arrest, which take us through maybe the difference between a heart attack and cardiac arrest. Uh, so the difference between a heart attack and cardiac arrest, the main difference being um, during a heart attack, your heart is still beating. During sudden cardiac arrest, it is not. Correct. So um, we've come to the scene and there is no heartbeat. So. Yes. Remind me, because I always forget, what is the ratio of compressions to breath? So nowadays we're actually teaching breathless CPR, so just continuous CPR. Oh, wow. Which you're looking at about 100 to 120 beats a minute. Okay. Continuous. You're not no longer stopping to breathe for the patient. Um, it has been determined through studies that they have about 10 minutes of oxygen in their bloodstream. Um, wow before you, you need to breathe for them and hopefully first responders are arriving by that time. Well, that's really wonderful. It really simplifies the whole process to not have to sit there and think, okay, how many breaths to compression? So when it comes to doing compression, show us what that would look like. So typically during compressions, what you're looking for is you're looking for the center of the chest, which, which can kind of be judged by in between the nipples. And then you're looking to compress the chest about one third of the depth of the person or about two inches. And what you're doing is you're just placing one hand on top of the other. You're locking your elbows out and you're pushing down. Wow. And I've always heard to be aware that the push has to be pretty dramatic and that you may in fact break a rib. Is that true? Absolutely. CPR is definitely a traumatic event. Um, it's, it's very common to break cartilage and ribs. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, take me through. How hard would I have to press? So lock out your elbows. Okay. And a little bit deeper. Oh my goodness. And a little bit faster. There you go. And let's say you're doing this over and over and over and you're getting yes. out of breath. Can yes. you tap someone else in to help? Absolutely. We, we use that quite often where we communicate with, with partners and even civilians standing by, hey, I'm getting tired. Can you sub in for me? Okay. So. And it is beneficial. Let's say this is a female and you have to go to the point of needing to utilize the machine and go to that demonstration of what that looks like. What's some steps you can take to maybe offer some privacy? Um, Definitely get get some people gathered around, you know, um, if there are blankets available or something like that, maybe just have a couple of people um, stand there and form almost a blanket wall um, from the general public to the person that is down okay. just to uh, preserve privacy. All right. Well, let's do it. How about you take us through the full using an AED? Okay. Um, so you would go through your process, of course, of, hey, not breathing, uh, no pulse 
um, somebody would start chest compressions. Now, um, if you were the first person there, mm -hmm. um, you're going to dial 911 at the same time. We have wonderful yeah. speaker phones nowadays, so you're going to dial 911, speaker phone, set it down, and, and start chest compressions and start yelling for somebody, hey, grab me the AED, grab me the AED. Now, AEDs are very, very self-explanatory. Um, some of them turn on when you open the lid. Others do not. Okay. Um, if they do not, you just have to press the power button. Then okay. they're completely automated after that. They're going to tell you what to do. Um, you can take your pads, and you're going to apply them as the pictures show. And just very simple. Okay. Um, so what you're looking for is you're looking to, before grabbing pads and stuff like that, what you're looking to do is remove the clothing from the patient's chest. And that can either be done by uh, just simply removing the shirt or if the AED comes with a pair of scissors, cutting it off. Okay. And you want to expose the bare chest. And then you're looking for uh, other obstacles, such as if they already have a cardiac monitor in place, whether it would be a defibrillator or anything okay. like that. You're looking for medication patches. You're looking for hair. Um, avoid those obstacles. A lot of AEDs come with razors okay. um, for removing hair. Um, or if they have two sets of pads, apply a set of pads and, and rip them off. Thanks. Um, as far as water goes, a lot of people are very worried to use AEDs in water. Um, wipe the patient off if they are just, say, they are just getting out of the shower or something like that. Okay. Um, wipe, simply wipe them off. Um, or if they are in standing water, um, move them. So they're not in water for the shock. How about jewelry? Can they have their jewelry on or should it be removed prior to? So like necklaces and stuff like that, just make ensure that they're out of the way. Okay. Um, and as far as people have uh, other pieces of jewelry, just ensure you're not placing the pads over top of them. Okay. So then where do the pads go? You said the pictures so, will show. Yep, the pictures will show. Mm -hmm. And you just simply ensure that they get a nice uh, grip with their backing and you just that's that all right we can kind of hold it up and show everyone the different placements and then what are some very important reminders before you turn it on and proceed with the shock so um, all AEDs today are automated they're going to tell you what to do they're going to say hey continue CPR they're going to um, advise you when to shock, when to not. You're not going to hurt somebody by applying an AED and they don't end up needing it because the AED is going to determine the shock. Amazing. So you can't shock somebody unless the AED allows you to. Amazing. And how do the placement of the different sticker pads work if it's a child versus an adult? So with a child, um, if you can still place the pads as shown and they're not touching, that's okay. Um, otherwise, go front and back. So middle of their chest and the middle of their back. For a child. Yes, okay. and um, some AEDs do have child pads okay. and some do not, but you can shock regardless. All right, should we go through a demo and show them kind of what it sounds like? Most certainly, so somebody would be doing CPR right now. Um, somebody else would have come and applied the AED so Remove clothing from the patient's chest. Open packet and apply pads onto patient's bare skin. Apply pads as shown in the pictures. Open packet and apply pads onto patient's bare skin. These are the training versions, the so nice. sometimes they... Open packet and press pads firmly. Skin. Do not touch the patient. Okay, this is where your do not touch rhythm. the patient. Do not touch the patient. Analyzing heart rhythm. Shock advised. And this is where you're really making do sure nobody's touch the touching the them. Right. So you're going to visually shock. clear head to toe. You're going to make sure your knees aren't touching Press them. Anything shock like that. Now. Shocking, shocking, shocking. Shock delivered. And then what must Begin happen? CPR. You're going to continue it. CPR right away. Um, you can continue CPR as soon as that shock is delivered. So Immediately, hands yep. on, and show us once more what that really looks like. Wow. 
and then will the machine tell you when it's time to shock again? Yes, so it's going to go okay. through the same cycle again. It's going to analyze them. You just those until it tells you. Yep, absolutely. Okay, wow. Well, let's say someone wants to go through an actual training. Where can they find more information? So they can reach out to the Champlain Police Department. We do provide heart safe classes. Um, you do not get a, any sort of certificate with that, uh, but you do get to learn how to do CPR. Um, you can and also reach out to things like the AHA and stuff like that if you are looking and seeking for an actual certificate. American Heart Association yes. diploma. What if someone or a local business is thinking, I don't have an AED nearby, where can they find one or get one? Uh, a lot of times your local fire departments and your local ambulance services are the ones to go through for that. They're going to have a person you can get in contact with that's going to uh, multiple different options, whether you want to buy one, rent one, etc. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Any last reminders for anyone? Uh, it's it's uh, very important to do CPR and get the AED on quick. You're not going to get in trouble for attempting to help somebody. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking us through this important aspect of the job. Most we certainly. appreciate it. All right. Well, now we're going to go check in with the Alina Health EMS for an update on Alina Health. Surfing just over 2,700 square miles across Minnesota and western Wisconsin, Alina Health Emergency Medical Services is one of the region's largest ambulance and medical transport services. In 2022, they responded to over 141,000 ambulance calls. We recently spoke with Dr. Joey Duran to learn more about the incredible team of paramedics and EMTs who responded to those calls. No one goes into this profession, or I would at least hope no one goes into this profession not wanting to help people. I mean, that's our primary role, right? Um, it, it, whether it's mental health, addiction, to the bad car accident, right? I really love working with our clinicians here and then our first responder, uh, communities, fire, PD. That's the favorite thing for me. Alina Health employs over 700 paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, special transportation drivers, maintenance, administration, and support personnel. These highly trained individuals are equipped to quickly respond to an emergency, assess the situation, and deliver life-saving treatment to all patients in their care. Our EMT basics um, can do, you know, they are very well trained in uh, CPR, first aid, AED use. Uh, they can give limited medications for emergencies like epinephrine for allergic reactions, um, Narcan, all of our first responders now pretty much in our area at least and most of the state have been trained on how to use Narcan. And then when you go up to paramedics, they can do advanced life support. So that's more IVs, IV medications. Um, they know how to run our cardiac monitors and how to interpret EKGs. Um, they also have just a higher order of critical thinking skills um, to decipher strokes and um, that type of thing. I think memorable things that stick out to me are probably when we've had bigger incidents where you know there's multiple agencies police fire EMS that have to work together and we have to work together as you know a unified team along with our, our dispatch center. Our dispatch center is again one of those kind of secondary thoughts but are so key and also very much impacted just like our clinicians are with hard cases. So that's when I get proud of our team the most because it, it is amazing to see how we can come together and really respond to a, a critical incident and really work together in an efficient way to take care of it. Well, of course, teams at Alina Health EMS can respond to any sort of call. Dr. Dern is especially proud of the assistance they provide in the quieter moments. Those moments that might not make the front page of the newspaper, but are just as important to those in need of help. The biggest difference our clinicians make is just being with people during hard times, right? Um, you know, we just got a thank you note the other day from a family. Um, a couple of our paramedics went out to a family member who was on hospice and was kind of in the last moments of life and the family was having a really hard time. One of our paramedics sat there and held that patient's hand through their last breath and just was with the family. And so I think those are kind of some of the unsung 
like heroic things that our clinicians do. It's not always the fancy stuff, but that stuff impacts families and patients so much more, and that family will remember how much those paramedics cared for them. Um, and so I, I, I think that's the bigger thing, is it, there's a lot of TLC that we provide and not necessarily super high level care. I mean, we're capable and, um, and very able to do that stuff when we need to, but then there's also just the, you know what, someone's in a hard spot and we need to support them and try to get them the help they need. Thank you so much for watching today's show and truly thank you to all of our first responders for your hard work and dedication.